Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Divorcing Religion Podcast. I'm your host, registered professional counselor and religious recovery consultant, Janice Selby. My guest today, I can hardly believe it, is Hemant Mehta, the founder and editor of FriendlyAtheist.com. In addition to being a successful author, Hemant is a YouTube creator and podcast co-host, a former national board certified math teacher, and continues to coach a competitive public speaking team. Hemant has appeared on CNN and Fox News and served on the board of directors for Foundation Beyond Belief and the Secular Student Alliance. Hemant's books include I Sold My Soul on eBay and The Young Atheist Survival Guide. And he also edited the book, Queer Disbelief. Wow, you are busy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thanks for uh, having me, Janice. And yeah, I mean, when you've been doing it, the activism type of stuff for many, many years, it seems like, yeah, all this stuff kind of comes and goes. Like some of those things you mentioned, I feel like, oh, wow, that was another lifetime ago. Yeah, yeah, and not to mention... (laughs) The older we get, time just seems to be speeding up, going faster and faster. Oh, and so your background is quite interesting to me because uh, you come from a religious tradition that's not very well known in North America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I grew up in a religion called Jainism, J-A-I-N. And the weird thing, like the good thing about it, the interesting thing about it maybe is so when I grew up, there really wasn't a temple where I lived because I mean, Indian immigrants in general, like my parents, like you, you end, you usually end up in a handful of cities with a lot of other Brown people. Mm -hmm. And so we were in one of those places outside of Chicago, but at the time that group of people didn't have the money for like a temple. Uh, It's not that different from a bunch of Christians who might want to build a church, but for now they're meeting in someone's house, maybe Mm -hmm. at a renting out a high school, something like that. We did a lot of that. Um, and eventually they did get enough money to, to purchase land and, and make a temple. But basically I grew up in this kind of disparate Jane community where we would gather once a month, learn about our religion. It was kind of a Sunday school prayer session, social gathering all mixed into one. And the thing is like, when I got a little older, we're talking like seventh, eighth grade, middle school we moved away from that community for Mm -hmm. my parents' jobs reasons. Um, And I went to a place where there were virtually no other, not just no Janes, but like no other Indian people really. And so now I'm confronted with people who not only don't know anything about my religion, but people who are like actively Christian. And I didn't feel uh, persecuted or anything like that. Uh, We weren't quite old enough where they were trying to get me to come to church or anything, but that difference starts to really stand out. Mm -hmm. When I started high school, we moved again, kind of back to that area, back to that community we were part of. And this is now I'm a little older. Now I'm in ninth grade. Now I'm old enough to start questioning, Mm -hmm. uh, why do I believe this stuff? Like, what is it that we believe? Mm -hmm. And that rabbit hole that a lot of people go down kind of led me to the conclusion that like, it's not just that I think my beliefs are wrong. um, I think religion is wrong. And, you know, I didn't know the word atheist at the time, but that's where I was going. And, you know, it took, it it happened pretty quickly. We're talking like in the course of weeks, like I realized, wait a minute, (laughs) this stuff, this stuff doesn't make a lot of sense. And then it took a couple of years to kind of figure out, no, I think I'm right about that. And it's solidified. And the more I read about it, the more I think about it, the more sense atheism makes. And keep I kind of joke about this when I give public <laughs> talks. But yeah. at the time, we're talking like, how do you even explore that sort of thing? Because I, I don't know how old you are, but I can tell you when I was in like ninth grade, we're talking AOL dial up. No Google, no social media, very few resources. So I'm like waiting till my parents go to bed, going on like weird chat rooms where they're talking about religion, shady completely. (laughs) But like if you find a blog or whatever they called it back in the day where someone's writing about what's wrong with religion, Mm. part of me is like this feels like some dude writing in his parents' basement, very angry. Mm -hmm. But also the dude in the basement kind of makes sense when he's criticizing religion. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, man, I think the crazy dude in the basement is onto something here. (laughs) Um, But 
but again, there were no real resources. I certainly didn't know any other atheists. Right. So I kind of went through high school, like thinking, I don't believe in God. I'm not really sure what to do with that. Mm -hmm. It seems it's one of the only decisions I've ever made, certainly at that age, where I felt like no one told me to think this way. No one told me to do this, but I've never felt so right about something else. Wow. That's so consequential, which, by the way, sounds like a religious revelation, too, I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) I'm wondering... Yeah. Um, what was going on with your parents at this time? Did they have like any inkling that their son was, uh, you know, deviating from the path that they had laid out for you? I didn't talk to them about it. I mean, I've even when I felt I was religious, even when I was religious, I mean, I would still complain about going to those religious sessions <laughs> for the same reason a kid might say, I don't want to go to church. Yeah. Um. So I, nothing really changed. A lot of this was happening internally, mentally. So I didn't tell them about any of this stuff. I wasn't going to debate them on this stuff Mm -hmm. because, I mean, this is the case with a lot of immigrants, people of color, for sure, saying, I don't buy into your religion. It's not just that. It's saying, I'm not buying into your culture, Mm -hmm. your friends, the people you have, who you depend on. Mm -hmm. Um, And that wasn't what I was trying to do. So like, it just wasn't a thing we talked about. Um, And not until college did I actually start a group with a friend of mine for atheists and start getting involved in national organizations. Like that's when I kind of became an activist in this world. Mm -hmm. Um, But before then it was kind of like, well, I think this is right. And I was lucky that some of the friends I had, even if they weren't religious, like if you talk about this stuff, it just wasn't that big of a deal. So I felt like I was in a safe community where Mm -hmm. I could talk about these things, have these thoughts without worrying about the consequences. And I just kind of had some time to myself to kind of sort through it, which not everyone has. So I got lucky in that regard. Yeah. So it sounds like um, perhaps your parents weren't as fundamentalist as some parents are. That's definitely true. I mean, even today where they do know I'm an atheist, but we still don't really talk about it. Um, I think the biggest thing for them is the values they raised me with. If I'm Mm -hmm. still basically adhering to those values, I mean, being vegetarian, Jainism has a strong belief in nonviolence, not just to other people, obviously, but like you shouldn't have bad thoughts. And philosophically, that is, those are good ideas, right? Um, And they were like, well, are you still vegetarian? You know, if I tell them I don't believe in God. And the truth is I am. Um, And it's like, oh, huh, well, then I don't really care. (laughs) Like, you know, that's kind (laughs) of where we landed at. It's like, okay, so you have some philosophical issues. No one cares. As long as you're still hopefully the person we raised you to be, the decent person, like that helped not have bigger arguments about Mm -hmm. it. You know, so the values mattered more than the label and the theology behind it. Yeah, that helped. And when I'm working um, with clients who have divorced or in the process of divorcing religion, one thing we talk about, because this comes up a lot with um, being concerned about our parents and losing that relationship or that relationship's going to change, when our beliefs change so that our beliefs aren't the same as our parents or our spouse or whatever, we need to shift over to a focus on values that are shared rather yeah. than beliefs that are shared. And it sounds like that's exactly um, how, how the transition was able to go with you yeah, and, and your you parents. It, yeah. And you put it so well there with like the divorcing of religion, because mm-hmm. it's like, we're not compatible, but we still want what's best for like the people around us, for the kids, whatever. And you can come to the same agreements. I mean, it might be contentious, but you still come to some sort of compromise on those things that matter to both of you. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, you go on your separate ways. And that, that is really how it felt in a lot of ways. Nice. And so your folks are aware of the work that you do, uh, but you guys don't really talk about it. Do they know? Do you tell them, hey, I won an award or I'm I wrote a book, you know, that sort of thing. (laughs) Nope. they're they're mildly aware that I do stuff like I think if you ask them, like, so what do I do for a living? I I, it would actually be really funny to figure out what their answer would be, (laughs) because I don't think they have any idea what I actually do. Um, not because they're trying to avoid it, but because like trying to explain to 
older people like, well, I, I write articles on the internet. I have a podcast. They, none of that makes any sense to them. Okay. So not entirely the fault of religion there, but you know, they're, they're still religious. They trust that I will respect their decisions in mm -hmm. that regard. And honestly, it, it really doesn't interfere with my life that much. So it's like, all right, nice. it's not something we have to talk about. We're okay. We'll deal. So right. it, it could be worse. I will tell you the one thing that made me laugh though, is as I'm growing, now I'm in college and I am an atheist and I started working with these groups, you know, like in the mid 2000s, 2006, seven ish, there were these new atheist books that came out and Sam Harris is one of the guys who wrote a book called The End of Faith. Yes. And the whole book's premise is fundamentalist religious thinking is really bad, really harmful, but moderate religious people are providing cover to those other <laughs> people. And that's also a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But one of the things he mentioned in there is that Jainism was almost a counterexample to everything he was saying, because he even said, like, you know, we shouldn't be fundamentalist to anything. It's really bad. However, <laughs> if everyone was fundamentalist Jane, <laughs> eh, we we wouldn't be so bad off because it would be nonviolence, like extreme nonviolence doesn't right. sound like a bad thing. And mm -hmm. he's wrong about that. But like, that was an interesting mm -hmm. thing to see, like, oh, my God, no one knows what Jainism is. Right. And all of a sudden, here's this really popular book that speaks positively of Jainism. Very yes. weird. And yet yeah. Jainism, um, like like any belief, uh, when taken too far, when it right. is, you know, when fundamentalism we just seem to swing either one direction or the other direction because that's what it's yeah. like to be human. Um, but even the idea that you, you're you not allowed to think uh, bad thoughts or you can't step on a bug or whatever it is, right, these, are, right. these things can um, take away our autonomy. Yeah, uh, you know? I mean, and, the, the part where it gets, didn't mean to interrupt, like the part where it gets really scary sometimes is, you know, if you talk about the high holy days in the Jane calendar, one of the things you're supposed to do, or at least you're encouraged to do, is fast. And if not fast, eat maybe once a day and mm -hmm. boil your water first so you're not hurting bacteria, things like that. Wow. And sometimes when I see Jainism in the news nowadays, for bad reasons, it's because some kid decided to literally fast for a long period of time with the encouragement of people around them. And guess what? It didn't go well. They got sick. Maybe they died. And it's like, how is it that all these adults in their life circle were watching this happen in real time and no one had the gall to say, you know, forget the religious thing. You should eat something. Right. Because, again, dogma of any kind, if if it goes unchecked, it can be bad, even if you're doing yeah. it for, you know, theoretically a nonviolent reason for a good yes. reason. Yes, I think it's the point where our ideology becomes completely enmeshed with our identity. So it's mm. not just I like this or think this is a good idea, but it's I am this. Yeah. And then we close ourselves off from differing points of view or even to new information that comes to light. Um, and instead, it's we perceive it as a criticism of us as a person. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's where it gets dangerous. And you mentioned uh, a really important word earlier as well, and that's the idea of culture. So yeah. we can we can we can be like, um, say, culturally um, Jewish or we can right. then we can also be very practicing Orthodox Hasidic. Um, and right. so at what point then if we say, well, actually, I don't believe those things. But then, of course, it can really cost us the, the closest closeness of that community and that culture. That's actually a topic that um, a friend of mine, Pesach Eisen, who's a psychologist, uh, and he grew up Orthodox, Hasidic, um, Jewish. And he will be talking about the difference between uh, cultural religion and uh, religion that is non-cultural um, at the yeah. next conference on religious trauma. So I think that's something that'll be very interesting for me. Yeah, to I mean, learn it, about. it comes into play even today because whether it's, oh, what am I going to do for a wedding, which you can't have an Indian wedding that isn't steeped in religious tradition mm -hmm. almost. 
You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like it was a lot of uh, negotiating is the wrong word, but ultimately it was like a, listen, my wedding, we get to plan this. We're not doing that religious stuff. Uh, but if you want to do something, you know, days before where you can invite your family and friends and like, I will suck it up and deal. <laughs> but on the big day, we're doing it my way. You know what I mean? Wow. Like, There's a lot of that. Same thing with having a baby and doing a baby shower. Mm-hmm. Is it religious? Not. I mean, how much of that I'm sure my parents looked forward to doing. And then here's someone saying like, no, I don't want to do the traditions you want to do. Right. Like, again, it's it's not just saying this is your beliefs. These are my beliefs. It's saying like all those cultural things that you grew up with, that you love, that you take seriously. I don't want anything to do with that. And again, I have a very good relationship with my parents. Nice. It's fine. But you could see how that could uh, in in other families and other cultures like that's a hard thing to do because religion is just baked in to oh, so cool. many of those cultural traditions and things like that so I, i've heard this from uh, secular jewish politicians too where it's like oh so you're an atheist you're a humanist and they're like eh, i don't use that word i am jewish right. not because i'm religiously jew maybe i'm a secular jew but like i don't want anyone to think i'm turning my back on this culture, on my people. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to use the word Jewish, even though I don't believe in the religious aspects of it. Like it pisses me off as an atheist, but at the same time, like I do understand where that thinking is coming from. Yes. I have um, another friend, Elam Zouk, and he grew up uh, in the Amish tradition and Mm -hmm. he refers to himself now rather than ex Amish. He refers to himself as a non-conforming, um, Amish person because he he feels like to say he's ex something wipes away all that tradition right. and, and history and like you're um, turning so. your back on everybody that you knew that you know like you don't want to do that and sometimes it's like I love you but I don't believe what you believe and how do you delineate that stuff that's not always an easy call that's I mean I've said this to of atheists too, which is there is an argument that I've heard often in the atheist world, which is if you just present, I don't know, biblical contradictions or some logical argument that God doesn't exist, Mm -hmm. that's it. Like that will convince people to become atheists. Like you're stupid if you still believe in God after all that. Mm -hmm. Why are you still going to church? I mean, that is something they will say. And it's like, uh, one, you think church is just about people who believe in God? No, it's so much more than that to so many people, social Mm -hmm. circles, safety nets, all Mm -hmm. that stuff. Mm -hmm. But also, I mean, I've heard this from black atheists too. Like it's not that simple because again, a black church is so much more than do you believe in God or not? It is the hub of culture, activity, activism, Mm -hmm. go to a black church. If you listen to those sermons, they are not saying what white evangelicals say from the pulpit. They are talking about lives and how Mm -hmm. to improve, Mm -hmm. you know, society, social justice type Mm -hmm. of sermons. I mean, again, if you haven't experienced it, it's very easy as an atheist to just say, well, if you just show black people the same stuff, we show white people or insert whatever other groups like that should do the trick and it's their fault for not buying into it. Um, And it's like, buddy, you're missing such a big part of the picture. And it's one of the reasons I've, again, I've said this to atheists too. Um, I have criticisms of Richard Dawkins, but when you look at the God delusion book that he wrote, it's, it has to be superficial. He's covering why religion is wrong, why God doesn't exist. But again, very superficially. But if you talk to someone who is a Mormon, and you want to convince them to leave the religion, you can't, I mean, it's going to be next to impossible to say, here, just read the God delusion and that should do it because the book, and again, this is not a criticism of Dawkins because he was writing a general book. Mm -hmm. You can't go to them because he doesn't know the depths of the religion or the specifics of it, or at Mm -hmm. least he doesn't talk about it in there. Mm -hmm. And unless you could talk to people who can walk you through Here's how you deal with the family and being like a black sheep in those circles. And like, what do you do? Because your entire uh, social network has been in the church. Like I've said, there are 
there are people who talk about being an ex-Mormon because they lived it. They are right. ex-Mormon. Right. And like they can speak to what you actually go through and what the complications are. Mm -hmm. And it's not just saying, here's why the Book of Mormon is wrong about X, Y, and Z. They talk about so many different things. Mm -hmm. And if you if you ever meet an ex-Mormon, like there are names I could give you like do you know this ex-Mormon guy? Do you know this ex-Jehovah's Witness? Do you know this group that helps uh, ex-Orthodox Jews? And it's like those groups met or those people matter so much more to helping people leave those faiths than just a straight up atheist who says God doesn't exist. And here's why. Yes. Because unless you understand those groups, those cultures, those beliefs, you can't just use a one size fits all. Here's why God doesn't exist argument and assume it's just gonna work on yeah. everybody. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying my interview with the friendly atheist himself, Hammond Mehta. Just a quick reminder to subscribe to the Conference on Religious Trauma YouTube channel so that you never miss an episode of the Divorcing Religion podcast. And finally, I ask that you support my work on Patreon. All the links are in the show notes. And now, back to the show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's true. And also, um, it speaks to a lack of understanding about indoctrination and how mm. indoctrination uh, happens. And particularly when we are born into a very religious uh, family and we are steeped in it and never given the opportunity to question it or for our personalities right. and temperaments to develop apart from what our parents' religion, you know, dictates the, the way that we are. And I see this a lot working with clients who grew up in very fundamentalist homes um, and have developed a lot of codependency. And, and mm -hmm. they are so used to being chameleons and morphing to fit whatever partner yeah. they're with or whatever circumstance. And the resentment builds when we are not allowed to be ourselves. And I liken my own change when I finally got to the point of divorcing religion. It's like holding that beach ball underwater, just keeping it under and the pressure builds, the pressure builds, and finally you take your hands off mm. and the beach ball comes up and it's a huge mess and gets all over everybody. Um, and that's what it was like for me. But it took a series of very personal family tragedies to shake me free from my cognitive dissonance, to actually mm -hmm. get me to the point where I was willing to say, I think I've bet on the wrong horse. God may be somewhere, yeah. but he's not in here. So I'm going to look at other religions and see if he's there. <laughs> he wasn't. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> And, and for me, like it was a part of me. It's something I believed and I could question and it was fine. It didn't shatter me, because, but it made me rethink some things. But for people who grew up in a more fundamentalist type of faith, like where it is you, where yeah. your entire being, your goodness, if you mm -hmm. consider yourself a good person, why mm -hmm. are you good? Because of religion. Mm -hmm. To say that the religion is wrong, it's like, well, you have to rethink everything. I mean, deconstruction, whatever phrase mm -hmm. we use, whatever word mm -hmm. we use to describe that process. Mm -hmm. It's so much harder for people who believe everything good that is happening to them, every thought they have mm -hmm. is because of God. And then to say God doesn't exist, it's like, imagine how many rewiring, yeah. how much rewiring you have to do in your mind mm -hmm. to make the world make sense again. Yes. It's a big ask. It's not that it can't happen. Of course it happens. It happens right. all the time, but it's so hard to do. Oh um, gosh. Yes. So just this week, for example, I don't know when this is going up, but just this week, I mean, Britney Spears said she's an atheist. I saw that. And the thing is, this is someone, I mean, I know celebrity and it's hard to decipher what exactly the religious yeah. journey means for her. But we're talking about someone who grew up Southern Baptist, who was mm -hmm. in the news for exploring various other religions, Kabbalah, whatever. Um, and for her to say she's an atheist now, very interesting journey there. And I don't necessarily know all the theological thinking, the underpinning of all of that. Mm -hmm. But let's say that's true. To consider like someone who ra was raised in a religious environment mm -hmm. has spent her public life talking about how important faith is to her and to now say, for whatever reason, because she's been through a lot, that she doesn't buy into any of that. I mean, best case, I mean, giving her the benefit of the doubt for all of this, like I there imagine how hard that must be 
to not just go through everything she's gone through, but to say the religious beliefs that I had that gave me everything that I have, that gave me the talent, theoretically, like, you know, <laughs> that gave me everything. Yeah. None of that has helped me at this point. It's mm -hmm. actually caused more harm than good. I mean, that's a that's one anecdote and one person. But like that sort of thinking happens all the time for so many people. And it's mm -hmm. it's it's honestly it's amazing that anyone can make it through that journey. It's so yes, hard. You're you're exactly right. And it's the it involves the dissolution of an entire worldview. So where we had structure to hang things on, to hang our experiences yeah. on, that dissolves. Everything is suddenly up for grabs, topsy-turvy. And it is similar yeah. to what people experience when they think they have done everything right. Maybe, maybe not only a vegetarian, but a vegan, and they jog every day and this, that, and the other, and they get colon cancer. Right. Uh, or right. um you know the it's like very, what have i been doing with my life <laughs> that's right that's right or the very yeah. painful situation of um parents who think they've been doing everything right and their their child is killed by a drunk driver so then it's right. not only the immediate uh terror and grief of what's going on but the broader grief and terror of what do i believe now my entire yeah. world has been turned upside down and um where I once thought I was safe by doing all these things, I realize now that I am completely vulnerable because right. the world is random because bad right. things do happen to good people sometimes. Um, and so we really uh, learn a lot about grief and loss when we divorce religion and we learn about resiliency, about yeah. starting over again and about building ourselves from the ground up without those uh, beliefs that our parents had or beliefs that our pastor had or, you know, whatever was kind of pushed on us before we had the ability to critically evaluate. Well, you know, this sounds kind of fishy, actually, <laughs> this whole thing. You don't think it sounds fishy if everyone around you also believes the same thing. It just makes sense. Right. I once spoke to a humanist chaplain, um, Bart Campolo, is his name yeah. he but one of the things he said is when speaking to people who were non-religious who were coming to him for advice and guidance and things the hardest thing he had to deal with is when uh, sorry to be a downer here like when they suffered the loss of a child or yes. something and it's like it's hard enough to do uh i can only imagine it's hard mm -hmm. enough to do when you're religious mm -hmm. but for these people to come to him and say like all these people are telling us religious platitudes, mm -hmm. which they mean, well, it doesn't do anything for us. But how do you make sense of a tragedy like this without resorting to religious sentiments mm -hmm. and him trying to walk them through? How do you process that? How do you m move forward with that without religion? I mean, a big part of what I've seen in the atheist movement over the past couple decades really has been figuring out resources for people navigating life after they stop believing in God. Mm -hmm. How do you have a, a, a marriage? How do you raise kids mm -hmm. without God? Uh, uh, get through any tragedy without God. And like, it feels now like those resources are out there mm -hmm. and it's a much more interesting conversation that is going on in my world mm -hmm. in the sense of like, when I grew up there, those resources were not widely available yeah. and the ones that were were horrible um but there are books now there are forums online forums there are resources for addiction and counseling and whatever it is you need it's out there if you know where to look so now what do we do if you're non-religious and it's like well you know what we don't is the goal just to keep convincing people not to believe in god like we're atheist evangelists trying to run up tally marks right. somewhere or for once, can we say, you know what? The resources are there for people who are doubting their faith. That's great. We should have those. But now what do we do? Well, it seems like a bigger goal is defending church-state separation and fighting Christian nationalism. And mm -hmm. guess what? On a lot of those goals, turns out we have a lot of religious allies as well. And we can work with them and say, look, we disagree on this. We will argue about it tonight over drinks. But in the meantime, let us work on, you know, all these other issues here. Mm -hmm. And let's uh, 
let's focus on a shared goal. Exactly. And that seems to be where a lot of the activism is going, which is a good mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. So looking um, looking for uh, points that unite us rather than yeah. it's obvious the things that um, divide us. But if we if we want to keep from becoming divided altogether, we better also start looking for uh, points where we do um, believe the same and yeah, think, and think the same, share the same values. Religious. Yeah. And arguing for religious freedom for everybody, which is a thing pretty much all atheists are on board with, like mm -hmm. actual religious freedom for everybody, means if someone says I'm religious, you got to let it slide <laughs> mm -hmm. and then figure out, OK, can we work on this stuff? Like there was a push when I started getting involved in this sort of activism where interfaith groups, which sounds like a great idea, they did. They wanted nothing to do with atheists. Mm -hmm. Like we'll work with people of all faiths, just not you people. Right. They, more or less, they all embrace us now as mm -hmm. atheists, mm -hmm. but also politicians didn't want anything to do with us. Mm -hmm. Like they don't want to use the term. They don't want to work with us, even though we are now a growing part of like a democratic yeah. base yeah. of voters. But now you could see them actively. They won't necessarily say we're supporting atheists, but they will say, look, fight, uh, vote for me because I support church state separation and I mm -hmm. oppose religious intrusions mm -hmm. on how you should live your life. Mm -hmm. And guess what? That's a statement a lot of people, even religious people can get on board with. Like, yeah. so they're using those talking points more and more, which is a good move for the future. And notice none of these people are saying our goal for the future is just to create more atheists because that'll happen. But like, you don't win anything for that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're definitely experiencing the rise of the nuns at ONES. Yeah. Um, and so politicians have got to see and accept that changing uh, demographic as, um, yeah, as the old guard is getting older and uh, dying off and young people are expecting more and demanding more. Um, yeah. they, they're not willing to just stay in that religious box. I love speaking yeah. with my daughters and their friends who are in their 20s, early 20s, and um, just the sense of acceptance that I get from them around uh, sexuality and sexual yeah. issues and LGBTQ. And um, they're just fine with people being who and how they are. But what they're not fine yeah. with is other people telling them how they it's must fascinating. live. fascinating. The, like the you could go to any big public school in probably any city, doesn't matter, Bible Belt or otherwise. And you're right. Like if you go to a big public high school, odds are you're going to find a lot of the people like you just said about your daughters. You're going to find a lot of them where they're just like, I, I don't care if someone is gay. It doesn't. If you're trans, fine. Cool. Like we're good. Are you a decent person? Do I want to be your friend? That's the issue. But like uh, your sexuality, your orientation, identity, whatever. They're fine with it. They've dealt with it. And it's not even an issue for them like it is for older people, um, which is great. And I feel like the same way about being religious, where a lot of times if you ask them like, oh, what's your faith? Yeah, they might say they're religious. But if they say like, oh, I'm not religious or I'm an atheist or whatever, when I did it, the reaction would be like, oh, my goodness. And now it's like, yeah, whatever. No one cares. Join the club. You're not special, which is a great thing. I'm actually fascinated by the question of what's going to happen to to viewpoints and and the lives of atheists in the future, because we're now seeing for the first time this wide swath of like second generation atheists, third generation atheists, where your parents did not raise you with religious values. And like what happens when that's the case, because even most of the atheists I've always known, we're all former something else. Yeah. And you're we're starting to see an entire generation of people who they may not have been raised as atheists, but like religion just wasn't a part of their life growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and they know about it. They just didn't practice it. But like, what does that mean for our society when mm -hmm. you have an entire generation of people who never had to grow up with mm -hmm. the stigma uh, who were just able to be non-religious or be gay or whatever it was like I and almost be decent people and be decent people. It's almost yeah. like, oh, no one cares that I'm an atheist. I mean, I don't know if this is noticeable <laughs> to anyone who's followed me for a long time. I don't necessarily use the word atheist when I write articles or post things. I'm very much a this is just me. 
and I don't like religious intrusion into things, but I really don't spend any of my time trying to make an argument for why you should be an atheist. Like, and that seems to be a big change in what I've done <laughs> from what I started doing way back nice. when. And so is that just a matter of maturing? I would like to think that. I don't know if it's me maturing or me deciding I need something else to focus on because I've done the other one enough or that that's where the focus in society seems to have shifted. Because again, if if I don't feel the need to convert everyone or deconvert people, because right. again, I feel like I, me talking to them is, it's not a good use of my time. Just trying to find someone religious and start picking a fight with them. Mm -hmm. If they're curious about it, again, there are resources everywhere and I can point them to it, but I feel like it's a much better use of my time to say, here is something that uh, a religious group is doing. T today, for example, as we are recording this, um, a judge just said an HIV preventative drug. A Christian group said, oh, we don't want that in our insurance available to anybody because we oppose homosexuality. So wow. offering an HIV prevention drug violates our religious freedom. It's like, that's a horrible, like, who cares if you don't like it? You don't have to use it. But they were against people getting mm -hmm. access to mm -hmm. it for their religious reasons. And the thing is, that sort of decision ought to galvanize people of all faiths and no faith saying, that's a horrible idea. Mm -hmm. What's a better use of my time trying to convince those people to stop believing in God or to get them to say, this is a bad decision because religious fundamentalism in this sense hurts everybody. Yes. That I feel like that's a challenge I can go for. Mm -hmm. That's something I can convince people of. And at no point do I say like, you know, stop being Christian. It's like, no, no, no. Even if you are Christian, you should be against this. And here's why. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe it's just a shifting. What's the priority right now? Yeah. It's not trying to introduce people to atheism. I feel like most people are familiar with the concept. Right. Um, right. So, so yeah. I don't know. I don't do debates. I don't do debates for that reason. I, mm -hmm. I have atheist friends who love it. Yeah. And I have no interest in trying to argue why this argument makes sense. This yeah, one doesn't. Same whatever. here. Same here. I'm very much interested in um, equipping people to yeah. uh, move forward in their lives, to radically accept the reality that's in front of them right now, to be aware that there is grief that comes with um, losing religious faith or leaving yeah. or divorcing religion. So we yeah. want to be aware of that and we want to deal with that. And then looking forward, uh, building, right. building a healthy secular life and a safe secular community, supportive community um, for ourselves, rather than getting stuck in anger. And anger yeah. is a legitimate part of grief. And if people feel yeah. they've been sold a rotten bill of goods and it's wasted their life and it's controlled decisions they've made, they are going to be angry that's just a normal part. Of I have it. tried to explain like one of the most popular online forums for people who just left their religion is Reddit. And there is an atheism subreddit. And there it it routinely gets criticized as like, oh, it's just a bunch of anti-religious memes. And like you're just picking you're just going after low hanging fruit mm -hmm. and you're just angry and lashing out. And it's like, yeah, they are for exactly the reasons you just mentioned. Yeah. They feel like they've been lied to their entire life. Mm -hmm. And honestly, some of those like biblical contradictions that might seem old hat to a lot of people who've been doing <laughs> this for a while, if you've never heard them before because your church didn't talk about them or they were afraid of admitting any flaws mm -hmm. in their belief system, if you've never had the ability to think about that stuff before because you were sheltered or in a bubble or whatever, right? it's... It's mind blowing to realize this stuff was right there in the open. So like, I kind of want to tell people, you got to lay off on the atheists who for the first time have a, a vehicle to vent. Yes. Uh, and they could do so freely because they're doing it online and not at another person. Right. Like, Let that one slide. Yeah. That doesn't represent <laughs> everybody because a lot of those people are new. So yeah. they're dealing with their frustrations for the mm -hmm. first time. You got to give them some space here. Yes. And memes are, they can be so powerful. I mean, sometimes I'm still, it's like, I see, I remember I saw one maybe a couple of years ago and it was talking about pro-life versus pro-choice. And it was saying how, you know, God 
is definitely not pro-life. He killed everyone, killed every living being, according <laughs> to the Bible, in a flood. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that hit me like a ton of bricks because I had never actually considered that before. And I've been yeah, out of religion the, for years now, but it was so, and I still come across things like that that are just, yep, yeah, because I was so indoctrinated and in my whole community, <laughs> it, it's a shock. It's good. The, I, my most popular YouTube video to date on the channel I currently have is me basically, it, it uses a book that another person wrote as the basis but it goes through every single time in the Bible, God kills someone or sanctions the killing of someone. And here's the story. Here's what we know the Bible says. This is the death count according to what the Bible says. But this is what we estimate if if they don't give us a specific number. So you have two different counts. Like, I can back this up, but I can make an educated guess here. But the very end of that video is like God killed millions of people. Here's the exact number. By the way, Satan kills like 10, just so you know. Um, yeah. And again, for people who've never thought about it that way, mm -hmm. because some of the killings are just like, you you can't defend it. It's just cruel. Yeah. Um, no matter who you are. And again, I don't know who's necessarily watching the video, but I have to imagine some people, I hope, are watching it who have just never thought about it that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And this is true for any, like, if someone says what's a book they should read if they're uh, new or questioning religion for the first time, I would freely suggest The God Delusion. I have plenty of criticisms of the book. I have a lot of criticisms about Dawkins. But the book is a fine introduction if you've never thought about this stuff. There are other things too, plenty of other resources. But this is kind of the cool thing where there is an abundance of mm -hmm. options. Mm -hmm. And that's a question of what's the best option. Whereas when I became an atheist, I feel like the only real options that I knew about were academic, very boring uh, books yeah. about like, you know, dissect. It felt like reading a dissertation yeah. as opposed to someone actually trying to communicate with you, which mm -hmm. can be frustrating. And the cool thing is like, man, there are TikTokers talking about this stuff. It's an entire social media thing that is way above my pay grade. But it's like, oh, cool. If that's the way someone's being introduced to questioning this stuff, mm -hmm. that's fantastic because you're probably listening to someone talking your language in a way that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. Yes. Do you have any um, resources that you do uh, like to recommend for people or that you have found particularly helpful for yourself besides uh, Dawkins' book? You know, it. If it depends who I'm talking to, there sure. is no one resources uh, resource I give. There are books for sure, popular new atheist books that range in in how good they are. But honestly, if you type in a question about what you're struggling with, you know, is it okay to not believe in God? How do I find morality without religion? Mm -hmm. Honestly, if you type it into YouTube, the way we might have tried to look this stuff up in the past, or TikTok or whatever. Odds are you're going to find someone talking about these things mm -hmm. in a way that resonates with you. Mm -hmm. And that might be more powerful, even if I've never heard of it, than go into some book that has been around for a while. Um, so it, it, there isn't just one resource. I mean, I will. I feel like I obligatory have to give you a plug. I now write <laughs> for a website called onlysky.media yeah. where the whole purpose is we're not going to waste our time arguing about why God doesn't exist. Let's just use that as a default and write about where we go from here. So I write about news stories that talk about church date separation, things like that. But there are plenty of people who are saying, here's how I dealt with the loss of a child or a career that doesn't seem you know, kosher for religious people or... Uh, just talking about the James Webb Space Telescope and the pictures it uncovered about the universe, how can we interpret that in a way that resonates with us being non-religious? I mean, that to me is a much more interesting way of looking at the world than just, here's a book that tells you why God doesn't exist. Now go off. You're on your own. Right. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? <laughs> right. So, yes. Only Sky Media. Um, I'm glad yeah. to hear you recommend them. And uh, I was recently asked to submit an article for yeah. Only Sky. So I'm really pleased uh, to see that taking off. That's just wonderful. Yeah. Um, this actually concludes the portion of um, our show um, 
for non-paying uh, folks. I wanted to um, just remind people that they should be following you and they should be following me on social media and on YouTube. And to say in the coming weeks, I will also be interviewing Dan Barker and Annie Laurie Gaylor of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And the Divorcing Religion podcast will post new episodes every two weeks on the Conference on Religious Trauma YouTube channel, alternating with the newest video releases from Court 2021. And be sure to subscribe and you'll find links to all these things in the show notes. Thank you for um, taking the time to come on a, a podcast that's just starting out. I really hey, appreciate no, it. Keep doing what you're doing. I really appreciate uh, what you're doing, Janice, and thank you for inviting me. And uh, if anyone's interested in what I'm doing, the easiest way to find me is just search friendlyatheist.com. You'll find my stuff. Um, and uh, feel free to reach out if anyone has any questions. Oh, wonderful. Thanks so much. Take care of yourself, Heaven. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.